So in today's video, I'm going to um, solve a problem at work. And my previous video, uh, slightly linked to what I'm trying to explain here, is um, at work we have a bunch of sensors uh, that give temperature data to some industrial quality redundant controllers that keep the room temperature uh, below 75 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, which is what is recommended for the scientific equipment uh, that costs a lot of money to uh, maintain and repair. Um, so to have a good ambient temperature of uh, uh, less than 75 degrees Fahrenheit is desired. So while I was at work, um, so this was very easy to monitor. So every time I go to this particular room, go check the, uh, the temperature and um, I can go and give a feedback um, on, um, hey, this needs to be um, adjusted and stuff like that. And um, ideally, uh, this would uh, send out emails with warnings if something uh, goes wrong. Um, but the problem happens, especially during, um, there are like weather events or uh, weather related stuff that is uh, when we are in the transition from um, the winter to summer, that is when the ACs and the heaters uh, don't uh, go on and off at the same time. Um, so what happens is uh, this um, temperature controller kind of is a hit or a miss and uh, then we end up with uh, non-ideal room conditions. So the solution for this is probably a simple one to use a ESP32 chip uh, with a temperature controller that can send us emails. So this way, you know, it doesn't actually proactively go and change the temperature, but probably with these emails, I can get in touch with the right people to actually get this fixed in, in the right time. And especially during COVID, uh, when we mostly work from home, this kind of very, uh, easy that is we get this um, kind of uh, data from a lot of rooms uh, that can be automated and I will show you what I do with those kind of data. So in my previous video I have shown you how um, you can use ESP32 to connect to Wi-Fi in my case I'm using EDU Room software at University of Michigan which is a WPA2 enterprise Wi-Fi um, so this is only possible on an ESP32 and not on an ESP8266. I'll leave the links uh, for the previous video in the description so you can go and watch it. Um, so uh, the idea is to then use this ESP32. So what I got um, here was actually um, uh, the TTGO T-Energy. So what this has is an 18650 um, battery uh, holder. So you can put an 18650. Uh, so even if there is um, power, uh, no power, um, or I want this to be at a remote location, this can run on the battery for a while. Um, and then uh, I connected uh, an uh, OLED display um, using i square c protocol and also our BME 280 sensor, very inexpensive accessories. So the total cost of this is like less than 20 bucks. Um, so within, with less than 20 bucks, uh, we have a sensor. So I um, started programming uh, and then uh, get this data and send it. So in terms of um, the, 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 the Arduino code that I have in there, um, it, uh, gives out uh, the REST uh, API uh, that exposes the latest value from the sensor. It also goes and connects to the DNS so that I can access this on campus. Um, if you uh, want to do some in-browser rendering, Chart.js is pretty amazing. So um, it, it has something called PSRAM. So I store a bunch of uh, historical data on the PSRAM that can be rendered directly to Chart.js. So I can look at historical data directly on the microcontroller. And um, we also send this data to an Inplex DB server um, inside the campus. Um, and um, also this ESP32 can send emails out using uh, the local Gmail servers that we have on campus. Um, so if uh, you don't have access to any of this, so I that is this company called Initial State. Uh, they have a time series da database that can, that's on the internet. It's pretty amazing. It looks very similar to what uh, Invex TV does. And they also have REST APIs uh, that you can use to actually send data from the sensor to here. So my code that I have written here, uh, unfortunately I cannot share because this was done as a part of my work. Um, but if you're interested, send me an email. If an educational institution, I'm, I'm 
totally open to sharing the source code. Um, so what this does is actually sends this data to all all these different outputs and also uh, to an initial state uh, database. So today's video, I'm going to focus on how we actually do um, huge amount of data that is coming from multiple sensors into InfluxDB database. So what is InfluxDB database? You probably heard of MySQL when I was probably in high school, that was a craze, but MySQL is pretty good when you have a lot of different kinds of data. Um, so the data that uh, these sensors generate is something called as uh, a time series data. So InfluxDB is a time series database. That is one of the axes on uh, anything that you plot in a time series database is time. So you need time as one of the inputs and the data. So basically you can plot that as a function of time. So um, this is uh, the, the picture that you can get from InfluxDB's website. So what InfluxDB is, is actually a bunch of uh, time series database uh, that can get data from something called as telegraph. So you can have multiple um, sources of input that can be transferred into uh, Influx TV. But today's video, I'm going to show that uh, we have some libraries in Arduino where these devices can send data directly to Influx TV. And uh, this is pretty new over the last year or so. Uh, Flux is the language. They, they were using the SQL kind of thing, uh, which is so annoying. So the Flux is so easy. I'm going to show you uh, some examples of these Flux queries. Um, so basically, uh, you can uh, create huge amount of data queries uh, from this database and um, get the kind of plots that you're interested in. And as well as you can have alerting frameworks that is if something is not what you think it should be, it should alert you. So this is pretty, pretty good. Um, so I'm going to show you how you get this. Uh, uh, so basically, um, once the InfluxDB is in, in production on or on a server, uh, we can use uh, another software called Grafana. I'm not going to show you how to install this, but Grafana is pretty amazing at connecting with various inputs. Um, so basically, uh, in our case, the Grafana connects to InfluxDB, um, and then um, it can be used for monitoring. Um, so you can do a whole bunch of uh, mathematical calculations on the fly. You can do moving averages. You can get uh, derivatives and stuff like that. Um, and uh, the good thing about Grafana is you also have alerting networks. Uh, so basically, you can create a Telegram message or a Gmail. Uh, in our case, I use Gmail. That actually is set up as an alert. Um, so this way, anything that is out of normal, in this case, temperature above 82, is going to send me an email. Um, so, so, so that is one of those uh, powerful things that you can do once you have the data into the InfluxDB database. Um, so how to install InfluxDB? You can go to InfluxDB's website, uh, go and check out um, the various ways to install for the operating system of your choice. But in, in 2021, uh, the best way to actually install InfluxDB is use something called uh, Docker. Uh, Docker is independent of what uh, operating system that you're working in, whether you have a Mac, uh, a PC, or a Linux operating system. And uh, in order to install InfluxDB, all you have to do is Docker pull this command. Again, this is all in their website as well. And once you uh, actually uh, do this, uh, you would run this command. So you just say docker run minus p 8086 colon 8086, and then uh, what you want to run. Um, so what this means is it's actually forwarding the port of 8086 that is inside this docker to the outside. So I'll just show you how this works. So this is just a PowerShell that is open in VS Code. You don't have to use VS Code. You can just open any PowerShell on Windows. Um, open a terminal in Linux or an Xterm or terminal in, in uh, Mac OS, and you can just type in this command. So you just say docker pull this. It takes uh, about a few uh, five minutes or so to get everything pulled from the servers. Um, so um, I have already uh, downloaded it. That's why it is so quick, but um, have a little bit of patience. So it takes a while to actually get everything set up. So once you have that, uh, you can then uh, use this command called docker run. Um, so basically uh, it takes a few uh, seconds. So once uh, this is running, uh, you can then open a web browser and set everything up. I will going to walk you through every one of these steps. 
Okay, so now it is said, uh, hey, uh, I have already started this on port 8086. So let's open the Docker terminal. Um, so in Docker desktop, you see that it is actually giving a silly name to this, but you can again go and define the name that you want to give. Um, and then you can just say open in browser. Once you click that, you go and type in localhost colon 8086, you can then do get started. So username, uh, you can just call it whatever username you want to give. Um, so, Uh, give a password uh, that is uh, secure. Um, so um, this is something that uh, is very important. So you, you want to give uh, uh, organization in this case, for this example, I'm just going to say org. And uh, for bucket, I'm just going to call sensors. Okay, so bucket is actually the name of the database that you want to work with. Okay, so basically, again, um, so this is the user that is test and the organization is this tiny little thing that's here that you're going to use it. Um, so that's what you're not, you need to you know, you do that. Uh, and basically, you go on data and click on buckets and bucket of these databases. So in this case, this is that sensor bucket. Okay, um, then you can add uh, a few things like you can uh, define how long you want to keep this uh, database. So you can then say that, hey, just keep it for one year. Um, and so that, you know, it doesn't overwhelm. Um, so basically uh, this database is automatically pushed every 365 days. Okay, so you can define um, those kind of things for a particular database. Um, then what you create are something called as tokens. So you then click on generate, uh, read, write token. Um, so so I'll just call it uh, sensors underscore token. Okay, you can name it whatever you want. In this case, it's going to um, have access to the reading the values from this as well as writing. Okay, so we're going to use these uh, token to actually read and write into this particular database. So then you click on this, uh, then it gives you this big um, alphanumerical uh, token that you're going to use for the next few steps. So remember, you require the organization, you require um, the, the bucket, you require the IP address, you require the port, and you require this particular token. All you have to do is um, use this particular library. So someone has done all the hard work. It's on GitHub. I'm going to leave the links for this below. Um, so once you get this installed, you just uh, type in include this particular library. Um, and then you want to define these four things. So basically your InflexDB URL is going to be the IP address colon the port. Uh, if you're going to follow my instructions, you can just use 8086 and this will be the IP address. Don't use localhost, right? Um, so localhost is because this is on this particular computer. So you want to install, uh, you want to put in the IP of where you installed your uh, InflexDB database. Um, so this is that token that I showed you in the last step. That is this alphanumerical value. And you go and put that value over here. Um, this is the organization. So remember, you can then, uh, if you forget what you put in, you can go to your settings profile and under the name, you'll see this particular organization. Uh, and for uh, the bucket, we, we're using the sensor bucket. Okay. Um, so once you define that, all you have to do is put this particular line in on top of your code. And then you want to define a sensor. In this case, this is just a sensor that uh, reads uh, temperature, humidity, and pressure for that particular room. Um, so you can also add tags that are common to this particular sensor. So in this case, you can say, hey, this is a device. This is the name of that particular device, as well as uh, the location. So basically, you can then uh, get that kind of information as well. Um, once um, have defined all that in your setup. Um, every time that you get data, that is every 30 seconds, 40 seconds, every minute, whatever it is, is um, the frequency that you want. You want to clear this particular sensor value and then um, you can add different values. In this case, uh, I'm reading the temperature and putting it into this temperature variable. So you can have as many variables as you want. And once you have added those values, then you can go in and put um, the client or write point for this particular sensor. So basically what this will do is go and put that data into the InfluxDB database. So in my case, I have three different sensors in three different rooms and they all continuously send data every uh, 30 seconds. Um, uh, all that data is put into that InfluxDB database. And uh, I'm going to um, then uh, once this data is put in there, I'm going to read it on Grafana.
So uh, you can open Grafana. Uh, I'm not going to go into instructions on how to get this installed. You can go to the website, and install it. You can use Docker as well. Um, so all you have to do is uh, go to configuration, say add data source. Um, so it'll give you so many options. Um, so what you have to do is type in flux, F-L-U-X. Um, so in this case, you just click on this and select. Okay, um, so here uh, you would uh, then give a name, uh, the query language, so it depends. So if you have the older influx DB, like one point something, you'd use a, uh, the SQL kind of language, but um, I'm going to show, I'm going to use Flux, um, and this is going to be the IP address. So you want to put in um, the IP and then the port. Um, so whatever is your IP and then the port. Um, so um, here uh, you want to say, uh, you want to um, use no authentication. The organization is going to be your organization that you have set up. Um, so the token is that same token that you got from your InfluxDB. So that's going to th be this guy. You don't have to define uh, a bucket and then you just say save and test. So in my case, I already have this set up. Uh, so I'm just going to show you one of those dashboards and uh, these influx queries. So in, in Grafana, this is just uh, showing some temperature data from three different sensors over here. Um, so here, what I'm doing is saying, hey, um, from this bucket sensors, um, from the time that I defined here, till the time that is defined over here, so start and stop, uh, you filter the device name, uh, you uh, filter the temperature because it also gives out temperature, humidity, and pressure. So in this case, I just want temperature out of it. Um, and I drop a few columns, so the measurement and the field. Um, so this way, it kind of gives me a linear data. And uh, then what I do is aggregate over 15 minutes and get the mean. So it's kind of like uh, um, gets average over 15 minutes, and that is what is plotted over here. Um, so basically, this is... Uh, gives me within one glance, I, I can get a very good idea about what is happening over here. Um, so I'm going to show you how I create alerts. Um, so then I have some similar queries over here where I just get the last value over here. Um, so in, in these alerts, what I can do is get these uh, last values from this. And once it is uh, above 80, it'll send me an email. So basically um, here you see that is that alert. So if this particular temperature goes beyond 80 Fahrenheit, um, it's going to send me an email. So this, this is this is kind of like uh, um, those notification settings. Again, here you can create, uh, send emails, send telegram message, whatever. So you can have multiple um, outputs uh, for notifications. Uh, so this way, uh, it also actually also creates a, a picture or a snapshot of what is going wrong, and then it is going to send you that uh, particular message. So Grafana along with InfluxDB is very powerful, and this is just showing you real time uh, data from my sensors that I have at these rooms. Uh, and uh, hopefully uh, this gives you an idea how you can take huge data sets and actually uh, plot it. Uh, you can also get the gradients as well. You can create uh, derivatives. Uh, this is very powerful. So you can uh, create those kind of information from here. Um, you can also create statistics as well. Um, and you can use this data to do some kind of machine learning and kind of uh, get these alerts based on uh, those um, advanced uh, you know machine learning algorithms that can figure out anomalies among huge noise of this data right you want the temperature to be constant and that's what it is but then once you see something like this it would alert you saying hey I, this is something abnormal and stuff like that so you can do all those kind of things again i'm not going to go into that um, but this is like a very quick and simple way to get a lot of data plotted get that kind of reactive information and uh uh, proactively go and fix whatever the issue in this case uh, the temperature uh, that is uh, the anomaly that i'm looking for so yeah so go ahead and try it out uh, leave a few comments if if you have issues um, go and check out that particular library i'm going to leave those links below as well bye